Oh, I want to see Look upon his face Better sing forever Oh, I want to see There it is <clears throat> Better sing forever Of a saving grace On the streets of glory Let me lift my voice Cares have passed Home at last Ever to rejoice Oh, it's a great one here, y'all as I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pride pierce my soul, there it is, from without within, but my Lord leads me on through him, I will win, and this hole I want to see him, look upon his face, ah, that's R.H. Cornelius, y'all. That I sing forever of the saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares have passed, but home at last, ever to rejoice. That's uh oh, I want to see him. Y'all know nothing about that right there. That that right there has been a blessing to me in my posterity. Listen, today I'm gonna talk about speaking of posterity, cheering, and how we have uh, not uh, been teaching right. Or is this a case of we've been teaching it wrong and so the cheering have uh, been listening or studying and realizing that we're wrong, All right? So when I put this show on the on the Facebook thingy thingy, uh, I see that the responses are quite gripping. I will read the responses in about 60 seconds. Hang with me tight, will you please? Uh, thank you. Bass. It's the show that will get you thinking and where the topics are hot. Feel free to comment whether we agree or not, cause he's got something to say. Sir Walter Jones, Sir Walter Jones, he's got something to say. Sir Walter Jones, Sir Walter Jones Show. Come on in. The water's fine. Yeah. Oh. Do uh, hello everybody, the Soul of the Soul of the Jones show. I'm here. It is the evening edition. Baby. Hi Otis, come on in. Water's fine. Water's fine. Good to see you, Ruth Chester. Adams is here and Casey's here. Pringle is here. Love them chips. Mm -hmm. uh, Seals is here. Carter and Weaver and Vaughn and a whole bunch of y'all are coming in here. Michelle Carter. All right. Listen, I want to talk about this. Hey, Nancy Paxson, what do you say? Hey, grace and peace in the midst of a celebration. It's the newbies. Double nickels birthday. All right, Nancy. Hey, man. Congratulations and celebrations to you. Akins is here. All right. The young folks. Uh, they're learning stuff, uh, and um, and who teaching it to them? Hmm? Apparently, y'all stop having dinner together and breakfast together, and stop watching TV together. You don't go for walks. You don't you just don't do nothing together anymore. And so the kids are left to their own devices, uh, and they they become latchkey kids, and somebody else is raising them, and so they're being influenced by the other somebody else's information. That's your fault. Good to see you, Edward. Blessed to you, Jeffrey Thompson, my my dear brother. Big ups to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I put that on the on the wall here, a brony Scott said, "Yeah, our generation dropped the ball because we were too busy trying to get what we can get. Also, we kept telling ourselves that we would not force on our children what was forced on us." I agree with her. Say, listen, I'm gonna let my children have it easy. I'm gonna sh care for them, share, hold their hands, and walk them across the street and do all these things for them because, you know, because that generation above us made us work hard by the sweat of the brow. So we try to protect our kids, not realizing we're doing a damaging, damnable thing by just 
holding their hands and letting them, they can't even fall. They can't even, you know, we, we did dangerous stuff. We walked outside barefooted. We stepped on rusty nails. <laughs> we drank from the, uh, uh, from the fire hydrant water and from the holes. We put that whole hose in our mouth and drunk from the holes in the backyard. We played in, in um, uh, vacant lots. And we and if they, they we played with uh, uh, abandoned cars, junk car. We played in the junkyards, and we would be in the car playing around with abandoned cars and glass everywhere. We didn't care. We jumped in the back seat, act like we were the passengers, and we jumped in the front seat. Okay, and we would uh, for, we would take tires uh, and we would roll them down the street. Everybody had their own special tire. If you had a fire, a fire, uh, a good a good wheel, no fire. What's the Firestone? If you had a Firestone tire, you was the bomb. You was wealthy. That was right. And he had a Firestone. And the good wheel, a good, what's, what's the other tire? Good, good one. Yeah. Mm hmm. You had to have a fire, Firestone. That was the bad, you had the baddest tire living. All right. And we did all of that crazy stuff. All right. And um, yeah, they, come on, Tyreek. We flipped off of pea stain mattresses. We saw it was it was pee and uh, it was sperm and all kind of stuff and nope we just jumped up and down jumped up and down good year what I said good win yeah good year <laughs> just jumped up and down that stuff all right put our face in it went to act like we're going to sleep in in somebody else's urine field bed that was the stuff we did y'all. And rarely did we have to go to the hospital for it, and there were no vaccines. We'd have well, we were vaccinated eventually as children. Yet you had to get shots. Okay, maybe that that maybe that's what saved us. No, maybe that did it. Well, vaccination. <laughs> uh oh, I just did a commercial. <laughs> okay, we did all that stuff. Our parents let us go outside, and we stayed outside all day. If it's a Saturday, of course, or if after school, after we did our homework, all day. All day, all night, we just stayed out there, okay, until that street light, you had to be home, not when the street light came on, you had to be home before the street light came on. That kept us, kept us out of danger, hurt, harm, it, it gave us more discipline, what have you. But meanwhile, Saturday, after the last, comer the last cartoon came on, which was Fat Albert, came on around 1 or 2 o'clock on CBS once that commercial, I mean, that cartoon came on, you knew that was the last cartoon to play for Saturday, and you had to go outside and play. And you played until Soul Train came on around 3 or 4 o'clock. You came back in, you you did your little Soul Train dance, and then when that was over, about an hour, you went back outside, and you played all day. Parents didn't worry about where you were, but you knew what time dinner was. Mm -hmm. Walter! You knew if I was two miles away. Which I often were. Walter! I heard my mother's voice two miles away. Oh, that's mom. <laughs> you been back home and you ate. And then street lights came on, you was on the porch. You was in the house. And all in the family was on, you know, Sanford and Son, Good Times, whatever was on, okay? And you watched it and, and you and you washed clothes and you took a bath because you had to get ready for church. That's just the way it was. Today if I go outside at 2 in the morning, guess who I'm going to see? I remember when I first went to New York and Times Square, it was about 1, maybe 2 o'clock in the morning. It looked like it was because it's so bright out there. I saw cheering, cheering out there. Just having a great old time. Little kids out there just. I said, man, we in trouble. We's in trouble. Mom had two rules. Uh, you better not let the street lights beat you home and the cops better not bring you home. Come on, because you got another whooping. Yes. When we had a snow day off, my brother and I had to go and shovel sidewalks and better not complain about. It. Come on. Come on, Sydney. And we had to shovel the snow out of the alleys. Uh, you people up, you people on the maritime areas in the New York and in those areas over there, Washington. I don't know if y'all got alleys over there. I know New York don't really have any alleys. That's why y'all's garbage is on the, on the street. We don't play that garbage on the street stuff in Chicago. We don't play that. We don't play that. Uh, put that in the alley. All right. But we had to shovel the alley. The snow. My daddy made it go back there and just shovel the alley. For what? 
Well, because the garbage man got to get back there. <laughs> you know, and there were some garages back there. Some of the, our neighbors had to get in there. So he made a shovel. That's just the way it was. Not today. Not today. Sydney so, said, oh, yeah, we got alleys. <laughs> Not in Manhattan, you don't. <laughs> uh, <coughs> all right. <coughs> so what I'm saying here, Stephen, uh, Pastor Thurston said, uh, maybe we found that some of these foundational beliefs aren't as solid as previous generational thoughts. All right. He was speaking of my uh, when I put up there that we dropped the ball. So he said, maybe the ball that you dropped should have been dropped. Well, let's see how we can fix this today. I grew up in Brooklyn, but our community didn't play that. Margaret say. <laughs> Now we're invading the kids' peace. Let the law tell. It. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the kids are divorcing, y'all. They're divorcing their parents. They're filing lawsuits against their parents. And they ain't nothing but 16. Free Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> Rules, manners, boundaries, and structure. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. All that in a bag of chips, y'all. So let's see what we can do with it. This generation isn't walking away from, from foundational teaching. Foundational teaching was never taught to them. I disagree with you, Brent Dick. It was taught to them because it was taught to me. And then I taught it to my children. So are you talking about the generational X's uh, not teaching to the, to the generation disease? Because your comment is incorrect. <laughs> I believe that when God used Generation X to expose certain truths, Generation X, in an attempt to flee religious dogma and rhetoric, confuse the differences between, yeah, foundation teaching versus rhetoric and dogma, resulting in the perpetual state of rebellion. I agree. What has been dictated to us? Mm -hmm. What has been dictated to us? What, what, what? How do we interpret, how do we deal with uh, this thing as a Generation X? Because I still believe when I did that show last year, maybe, I don't know, but I, I, whether it was a show or whether it was a Facebook post, I mentioned that God is using Generation X and we might be their own last hope for the world. If you're a baby boomer, I don't care what you think. If you a millennial, I don't care what you think. Generation X is the last hope for the world today. Will there be more generations after Z's? It could be. Because to say Z don't mean the end because we thought Y2K was the end. You know, man always give, give things names that, that make it feel like it's the end. But the end seemed like it this never comes when man decides it's gonna be an end. So I believe that Generation X is the force that should have been reckoned with. <laughs> that me, y'all. That's why I go so hard, and that's why I scare folks. That's why I scare pastors. They ain't bringing me into the, the churches. They scared, they scared of me because I'm teaching them not just foundational stuff, but I'm also teaching them. Uh, what Pastor Thurston said here that some of the stuff that was supposed to have been rooted in foundation was uh, some where some uh, where the wheat was some tares were sold in there we lose respect for absolute truth then our morality becomes relative yep I agree solely agree okay I did do that show God is using Generation X to tell the truth Facebook Okay, did that, ever, did that ever make it to YouTube? God is using it to tell the truth. And he used us in a mighty way to tell the truth. And he and the Satan began to use us to tell a lie. Last year, especially, many of the white evangelicals were lying and talking about Trump was going to win by a landslide. He didn't even win by a, a breath. Okay, all right. So this foundational teaching, what do we do? Why so many young people are being pulled by every wind of doctrine? Well, it's it's yes, we're responsible for that. So what do we do? We got to get back out there, y'all. Y'all have got to do something with your children. Stop depending. It's not on YouTube. OK, well, we got to fix that. I'm not sure why it would not be on YouTube. That would be a YouTube show. Mm, interesting. Stop depending on the government to raise your children. 
Come on, Craig Milan. Stop depending on your the generation, the the, the um the government and stop depending on the school system also to train your kids because if you're looking for the world to teach morals we're in trouble look at the laws now the laws are turning over to immorality the laws which used to be at least the united states is not a christian nation but it was attempting to be a christian nation it was a facade of christianity a facade so they were trying to implement Christian values, but unfortunately, they fell asleep. They were they were never really Christians, so it was easy for the, the that doctrinal belief to come in and turn. So what used to be bad now is good. What used to be wholesome is not as wholesome anymore. Ah, that's just old stuff. It doesn't work that way anymore. And then they began to implement that in the laws. We're in trouble. Samantha, good to see you. Who faces that? That you? Little cute little girl. It is on YouTube. But I thought so. I, I I'm like, okay, that one have to be because I didn't. I did that show probably last year. What right? And every show I did last year is on YouTube. Everyone, uh, misrepresentation produces misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, what what Brentick say? Uh, the latter millennials born in the nine in the nineties and Gen X weren't always made to come to Bible study. True. That's the problem. They were taught to sh uh, shout, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, I blame the prosperity. Yes. Okay. Because I, I worried about your earlier comment, Brentick. And I said, Brentick, no better. He know better. <laughs> and boomers with good gospel sense have to help them because a lot of them don't want to be bought because of what they saw in unrighteous church leadership. So they're bucking against it because of what they saw. They were... They, church hurt became a big phrase it was already a, a silent phrase but it became a big open phrase later on especially through the millennials and then and, and and they look at church hurt a different way they were like bump all that church hurt when your foundation is shaky the building will eventually fall mm, 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 mm. that's good i believe it's like you say there's nothing new under the sun as we get older we'd like to see more young people leaning to god but imagine how our ancestors felt when the beatles elvis jimmy yes it's yeah nothing new i believe the racial that's true so this whole thing with the trap music and the styles that we are implementing mary mary you and your late 40s and you tell me some you don't love god what's wrong with you kick 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 Okay, you too old, man. What what does it look like? I'm in my in my fifties. Yeah, I'm trying to do this hip hop. Um, this this um, a flavor. I'm all of a sudden I got on some. I got on, I put on the Kango <laughs> and a starter jacket in my in, in my Adidas. <laughs> okay, and I start I start rapping to y'all. All about the Sir Walter Jones sermons. How stupid would I look? Ha! Huh? Hip hop, a hibbity, the hibbity, Jesus rock. You don't stop. Bang, bang, and boogie to the up, jump, the Ezekiel to the rhythm to the boogie, baby. You know, thinking that I'm going to try to win the young folks. Kirk Franklin tried that with Stomp in the in the many of the other songs, and he was trying to win the young people at his age, and he realized out of his own mouth that it wasn't working. They were just dancing to the beat of a different drummer. All right. And they just danced and had a great time. And then they walked away from the music. They turned the, the music off. The song that says from, uh, what's his name? When the music stops, boom. That's when I live the life I sing about in my song. All right. Um, what's his name? I met him on stage. What's his, what's his name? He, he's gone now. He's poor guy. He's gone now. Um, uh, that he realized it did nothing when Sunday comes, Daryl. Yeah, Daryl Coley. I, I have to sing one of his songs. Understand, Daryl Coley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good man. I miss him. I miss him. All right, it did nothing. Kirk says, I presented those songs to them, and he said, he Ain't win nobody. Music don't win no win, Music don't win nobody. I know y'all like to fight with me on that, but y'all still ain't proved nothing. Your testimonies don't mean nothing. They don't mean nothing. 
I don't mean all testimonies don't mean anything, but if your testimony or your experience goes against what the scriptures say, then your testimony is subject, suspicious, suspicious. You understand what I'm saying? It's suspicious. Because there's nothing in the scriptures that says that the music saved anybody. It just brought people to a remembrance. When somebody come to somebody made this analogy on YouTube and he and I were going back and forth. I don't know if it was he or her. We're going back and forth on that whole issue. And he was like, no, I remember I was up singing this song. I forgot the name of the song. And this woman came up to the altar and she said, I want to be saved. And, blah, blah, blah. and she said, because of the song, she said, did something to her and gripped her. I said, oh, that's, is, is that your testimony? Yes. Is, is, that, is that what you're going to stand on? Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, she was not a, a new Christian convert. She heard a familiar sound. This is why we like, this is why if you go out there on the street, you hear sinners say, I used to be in church. The average sinner that you bump into used to be in church or their parents drug them to church or they'll bring up big mama or mud dear a familiar thing they know who god is they just rejected his practices his his commandments that's all that was and the music reminded them it didn't save them the music didn't save them the music set an atmosphere and it reminded them of what they've been rejecting they'll go to the altar all right i did the show on the altar call See, you got to go to that show to see where my point is. They run to the altar because they heard something familiar. And all of a sudden they, they say out of their mouth, they give their life to the Lord. Follow them home for the rest of the week. Everybody runs to the altar. I can't tell you how many times I ran to the altar. I didn't believe none of that. Because my actions show I ain't believe none of it. I had an emotional setback. And it lasted this long until... A wind of doctrine came my way. This is why Jesus made the analogy. If we keep bringing this up, Matthew chapter 13, about the seed that was sown. A lot of these people run to the altar because they heard a, a song. And then, then when they get back out in the world, they get pulled through a vicissitude. Well, how did they get pulled? I thought the song pulled them in and saved them. No. They got pulled. <laughs> Uh huh. Why altar calls can be dangerous. I know I did that show. I know I did that one. Money is being preached more than the gospel, or the gospel is being weaponized so that you feel bad and give more money. Come on, ever hey, you preach it early tonight? Uh, yes, we dropped the ball. Church was structured around adults and pushed the younger generation to the future. Yeah, they were called the church of the future, not the present. Roy Sims, you got a point there. You got a big, major point right there. I can't argue with it. None of that. None of it. So they had to implement children's church just to implement, just to get the kids involved. Because when I was coming up, children's church was considered a sin. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, you didn't hear about no, you heard about children's church in the white churches, but not the black folks church. We as kids had to sit on the front row. We didn't, it didn't matter if the pastor was saying stuff we could not understand. I didn't understand none of that stuff that man was saying up there. But we had to sit there, be quiet, and listen. I understand nothing. <laughs> so what we we didn't do is reinforce it by going home and dumbing it down with our own children. That's why I had Bible study with my children every morning right after breakfast. And I dumbed it down a little bit. I've seen parents with their babies say, oh, it's okay. They'll be fine when it was a, a disciplined moment. Yep, these kids are self-entitled people today who are challenging everything. Yes, we came up under because I said so, and that was the end of it. Do as I say, not as I do in a sense. But he is right. That's why he's my best friend. We just told them what to do. And, and now the children are coming to us for questions. They need answers, and we can't answer it other than to say, hey, what does the Bible say? Well, it's your job to tell me, tell me what the Bible says. Go outside and play. That's basically what we do. Go outside and play or pray about it. Mm -hmm. Follow your heart and all kind of crazy stuff. 
We can't teach it to them. You know why we can't teach it to them? Because the generation above you also dropped the ball. Mm -hmm. Folks say it's a new generation, yeah, but it's not a new a new God. He's oh, oh, oh Robin, oh my Lord, that was heavy. We did not have no children's church. Everybody sat together. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if you move, you pews pinched. <laughs> When you struggle, you talk to God. I bet uh, when you were shoveling the alley, you were telling God all about it. <laughs> These, <laughs> that's good, David Weaver. Oh, I learned how to pray doing stuff, all the chores that my, my father made me do. Yeah, I learned I learned the words of prayer. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. We gave them Jesus, manners, morality. And then they get to the house of God and, and all hell broke loose because the preacher started preaching a perverse gospel and a lot were violation, violated. They, a lot of them were violated in the church. So there's a, there's a, a catch-22 situation here, right? The, uh, the older generation were teaching foundational principles that were godly. Yes. Then there were those who were not. They were dropping the ball or they were preaching an eisegetical theology. So there was a melt, a mesh, a melting pot of chaos. And so they, so some families of our children, some of the, our children got the good, good word and the others didn't get good word. They meshed. Now they're teaching their, their children, their generation Z's. And that's going to, same thing's going to happen. It's going to pass down, pass down, pass down like, um, herpes simplex, I don't know. <laughs> it's just going to keep passing down, passing down. All right. That fossilization teaching. So there are some who escape it and there's some who don't. All right. That is, they are remnants who get it. I'm glad that I got, I got foundational teaching, but I realized that in, in, uh, I don't know what percentage, 50, 60, 70% of that was great, good foundational teaching. 20%, 30%, maybe 40% was not good teaching. So as I got older, I began to learn who God is for myself. That is the problem, y'all. Your children are trying to learn God. They're trying to uh, force, be forced into them. Your God, your father's God, your grandfather's God, your parents' God, your uh, pastor's God, evangelist Bobo's God, the mother's boy's God. You, you're, they are trying to push their God on you without helping them show them that you can have a personal relationship with him and not just say it at the altar. Uh, do you have a personal relationship with, with Jesus? Okay. Before you get saved, they ask you these questions. Okay. And then they don't teach you how to have that personal relationship. So they gained a personal relationship. They went through the 1900s, 20s and 30s and 40s uh, through the stock market crashes and through depression and through um, Jim Crow uh, and through, and through um, um, what racism. Okay whether it was systematic, whether it was personal race, racism, community, whether it was on the job racism, okay? They went through that, so they had to learn God for themselves. Their children were born, and then they protected them from all of the struggles that they went through through the civil rights era. And uh, the, so all of the children knew was that they were always provided for, and they did not get the chance to know a God for themselves, and so this is not your father's old mobile. Y'all understand. So then what they did, they, as they got older, they began to try and test this God and push against your God because they didn't have one. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't give them one. All right. So they're trying to obey your God. Y'all understand. And so they're pushing against it, pushing against it. And you're getting mad because they're leaving your churches at leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. They're leaving your church because they come back to your church and say, hey, I got a question on tithe and offering and speaking in tongues and, and feet washing uh, and homosexuality, uh, uh, women wearing pants. And so they push all those questions on you. And then your answers ain't good enough. You can't really answer it. And they said, no, why? Because these kids have PhDs, master degrees. You know, they uh, they might even have just, they might have bachelor degrees, or they just may be so intelligent. They have real world situation, okay, intelligence, street smarts. And so they push you on that stuff. And you say these things, and they say, wait a minute, but that doesn't line up. That doesn't add up. That's not logic for you to say that. For instance, I have a video here that the great David Weaver brought to me today. 
Okay, this show is brought to you by the great David Weaver, by the way. All right, y'all explain this to me. What happened to this young lady? I'm going to play this video. David Weaver, you know what this is. If you don't, you will in a minute. My hubby would uh, teach at Sunday school, uh, but would not teach at home because his parents never did. His pop was superintendent, Jack. Common. The average pastor don't teach their children at home or didn't teach their children at home. Now, there's some men who became pastors later on after the kids got really up in there. So they, they were used to not teaching. So the Lord called them. But the kids are already in their late teens, maybe. And you're out of touch, out of touch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every chance I get. When they, if, if there's a moment when my, my daughter is, is uh, not uh, nursing, I'll ask her some questions. Some hard ones, too. I want to know why. Why do you think the way you think? Conversion, new heart, and transform mind. Yes. Biblical uh, literacy is rampant, so a lot of parents cannot teach their children biblical doctrine because we have motivational preachers. Yeah. Y'all heavy on this. Y'all heavy, heavy. Liberty was reinstituted and perverted as Generation X came into the knowledge. And put down their cognitive dissonance. Yep. And began, began to take precedence in lieu of foundational sanctification. There it is. Liberty and justice <laughs> for all. The liberty of feeling the freedom to think on my own course. And when you lean on your own understanding, you begin to be pulled in by the winds and the doctrines of devils and all kinds of stuff. And then there's the justice part. Most people who are marching on the street right now are Black Lives Matter and, and, and get rid of the police, blah, blah, blah. Justice part. So liberty and justice looks different than liberty and justice do, did from generational X and, and baby boomers' point of view. It's all left to your interpretation and what you, your environment that you come up under. Uh, the parents here are more hyped up supporting the children in games while not taking Yep, them to church, Tresca. And it's not so much to taking them to church. You don't really have to take them to church. You know, my problem is you're taking them to church, but you're not teaching them at home. That's my big problem there. They can't stay in church because when they go to church, they they see this traditional stuff that just don't make they're jumping up and down foaming and they're doing the same recycled stuff in church and these new kids like i don't i don't want this i don't want they either go to sleep or they rebel against them before you know it, they're out of there so what's the remedy to that well supplementary is to teach those kids at home actually church is supposed to be the supplement not the whole church is not the full meal the meal is, is prepared, the spiritual meal is supposed to be prepared at home. How do we know? Because y'all are reading a, a Jewish book. And and the Lord says through Deuteronomy chapter 7 and 11, he repeated it. He says that to, you, to you're supposed to do this while the kids are at home. Man, why am I doing this? Why? Because it's my show. That's why I'm doing it. It's my show. Do, 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 do what I want to do. I can't tell you. Okay, all right, look at what it say here. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and uh, 19. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 11 and 19. It say here, what it say here? And they shall teach them your children. You shall. Speaking to them when they sit in the house. It didn't say church. It say in the house. Walkers by the way. You're walking. Why, you, you ain't walking in church. When thou lies down. That's bad. And when you get up, that's in the bed, y'all. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of not the church, but the house and your front gate. <laughs> that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which thou, the Lord swear unto your fathers to give to thee as the days of the heaven. Come on, man. Come on. Why aren't you teaching this at home? And you read this Bible and you you skirt over that and tell everybody you got to go to church because forsake not the assemblies of yourself together as some are doing. So you're pushing a church a spectrum, but the kids go there. They're not really learning anything because it's a it's a it's a it's a general audience. And, you know, good and well, even the world understand, even those who are uh, uh, study uh, pe pe pedagogues um, understand 
uh, the 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 uh the style of teaching is very important and you can't you can't even teach a, a young a 12 year old boy the same as you teach a 12 year old girl in some cases you just can't you just can't Pitt says uh they can't teach that uh, teach what they don't know there it is mm-hmm. there it is stand fast therefore in the liberty where yeah Christ is all right all right I see what you did I seen what you did. <laughs> All right. So then uh, some parents push church because they don't know themselves. Timothy, Tim, Timothy, man, that's powerful. So then we have this problem. Pay close attention to this young lady here. What she says in TikTok. She represents millions of the children today. So the story goes that the devil was once an angel, but he was kicked out of heaven for wanting to be God. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, who the hell makes this shit up? Because that story is nowhere in the Bible. The passage that most people try to twist and manipulate to fit this narrative can be found in Ezekiel 28. However, this passage has absolutely nothing to do with an angel falling from heaven. Here, God is telling Ezekiel to go and prophesy, meaning the things that he's about to say have not even happened yet. I mean, none of this really happened, but follow me. Ezekiel goes and prophesies to a human king and tells him that he would soon fall because of his pride and because he thinks that he is God. Again, nothing to do with an angel falling from heaven, but a human king of a city of people being told that he would fall for wanting to be God. How then could this be the same devil that had already fallen in the beginning before he even told Eve to eat the piece of fruit? None of it really adds up. Another cherry-picked scripture used to support this idea of an evil falling angel can be found in Isaiah 14. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, you have been cast down to earth nothing about hell nothing about a lake of fire it says earth another thing to think about from that scripture isn't jesus also referred to as the morning star y'all we got a lot of work to do and whoever taught her that she's leaning on that heavy Which tells me she can't read. She's illiterate. She's illiterate. And 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 whoever gave that to her can't comprehend either. Illiterate. I went to church all day on Sunday and, and the three of the week. It did nothing for me but wow. Modeled and taught me. Wow, Ryan. Yeah. All right, so let's break. Let's 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 hopefully she's uh she's watching this so I can break it down. This bad teaching that she received. People never know how scripturally yeah, illiterate you are until you open up your mouth. You are not woke, you are scripturally dead, <laughs> young lady. That's true. Mm -hmm. No, she mentioned nothing about revelation. No, she can't go that far. Why? And ain't nobody showed it to her. Mm-hmm. No one showed it to her. The previous generation failed to implement logic. And in some churches, they still do the exact same things today. So she says, this cannot be talking about an angel from heaven falling from the sky. You're talking about a, a one, a, a king, a literal, literal human king. Okay. True. <laughs> True. So let's help the young lady. She needs better understanding that the book is, yeah, yeah. But the problem here is it's all in the same chapter, and that's what she can't see. And and it's difficult for a, 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 the illiterate to see the two points uh, that the scriptures usually bring up. Okay, in many cases, the scriptures bring up both the natural and the spiritual. And, and Jesus, when he's speaking in parables, he bring up the natural and the spiritual. You all understand? And if, if you don't know how to dissect a two, you're in trouble. Number two. I said it's always a number one or number two in my, my life, all right? Um, trying to separate, must you must separate when you're reading the scriptures, when God, when the Bible is talking to a, a different uh, uh, generations 
or dispensations. For instance, there is the there are the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is the same thing. Jesus used it interchangeably. Y'all tried to separate kingdom of heaven and then the kingdom of God. Ain't no difference. I don't care what y'all say. Ain't no difference. And one book, it's only one book in the New Testament that brings them up. Okay? They're the same thing, which is usually talking about the Jewish people, usually. Why? Because they understand kingdom. They understand that whole kingdom thing. Then there's a body of Christ in whom you're called. You who are born again, you who are who consider yourself maybe once a Gentile or you were a Gentile. All right. Some of you are Hebrew Israelites or some of you feel anyway. And that's right, Ron Matthew, uh, Ron Matthew, Ron Pringle. It's in Matthew. <laughs> okay. So, and I did that teaching on it and I don't have the whiteboard. I guess maybe I can pull that out sometime where you, there's a, there's a, there's a pie here and you got to split that pie in half. The left side is the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. The right side is the, the body of Christ. We who are in Christ are on the right hand side, spiritual. The left side, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, natural. Even the scriptures say it's not first natural, then spirit. And even that needs to be broken down because we're interpreting that wrong. Because that's that's that can be eschatology right there. Okay, so somebody had a bright idea to use what's called replacement theology. Replacement theology. Mm -hmm. What they did was they decided to wherever you saw Israel, you put church in there. One of the most dangerous things you could do is replacement theology. The dry bones of Ezekiel, 37, 38, and 39, you got to read them all. The dry bones. Somebody said that that's the church. These dry bones, witness to these, prophesy to these bones that they, 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 the sinews and the flesh, you know, and the blood goes through them and, you know, and speak to them. And they come back to life. Somebody said, that's the church coming back to life. No, it's not. Because when you keep reading, the man literally say that this is the whole house of who? Anybody? So when you are using replacement theology, and pushing the church in every way you saw Israel, the young people are coming up and say, but it's not working for us. Every time you use that scripture and tell me how to do a certain thing, it's not working. God ain't even blessing it. Why? Because you're reading somebody else's mail. Mm -hmm. This is the whole house of Israel. He wasn't talking to you. This is why I keep bringing up the whole tribulation situation. The tribulation is not for you. It's for the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. This is Joseph having a meeting with his brothers. So God removed you from the earth. You who are the, you are the bride. You who are betrothed to, to Jesus. You who are the body of Christ. He's going to remove you out of the way. So the Antichrist can come and Wheel and deal with the Jews so that Jesus can come and sit among that mess, that board meeting. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So you got to separate it. So in walk the illiterate who are, they're looking for an answer because they really don't like your church. And this young girl walks in and somebody whispered in her ear. And now her cognitive dissonance is strong. To where she even cussed and said, who made up this shh? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Debunking biblical myths, the kingdom of God. Oh, I did that? Man, I'm, something wrong with me. All right? So let's explain this to the young lady. Uh, tag her for me, will you please? Somebody tag her. Okay? Here, right here, you see where it says here, this is what she gets it from. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. That's who she's talking about. And say unto him, Thus said unto the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. She believes, and he is literally talking about the king of Tyrus. 
and stop there. Because when it continues, it talks about the Garden of Eden. Was he in the garden? This king? Was he there? Thou hast. Who is thou? Well, you have to go back here. Thou hast. Garden of Eden. Every precious stone. The king don't wear these stones. The priests wear these stones. And I did the show already where the um, the, the cherub or Satan wear these stones. Not 12. He can only, re he can only wear nine. I even told y'all which, which nine or which three out of the 12 he is not allowed to wear. And they're all here. Anointed cherub. When did God call a man a cherub? Hmm. So, so uh, whoever taught her that is going to say, well, this is talking about someone that this is one thing and this is another thing. But it says, thou has been. There's nothing above 13 other than 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation, king of Tyrus. Then it says, thou has. That's illiteracy. Then it goes on. If this, this, you, this, you cannot make this a man. You can't. So let's see what this study Bible says. Uh, the lamentation is similar to a taunt song addressing the king of Tyrus. Many see in this passage Isaiah 14 in whom she brought up the fall of Satan. A view held by several of the church fathers in the second half of the fourth century. Long time ago. Such as such an interpretation is strengthened in light of his extreme description. 16, they said 16 and 17 is strongly related to who Satan was. 16 and 17 right here. Man, that all says Satan to me. Stones of fire, cherub, old covering cherub. Come on. Lifted up because of your beauty, corrupted the wisdom and wisdom uh, of the reason by uh, the brightness. Don't no man got that kind of stuff. And what else did they say? Um, but does not. Uh, what am I? Remember? But does not take full account of the context. The fall of the king's tyre might equally reflect the fall of Adam, the first king, as well as the fall of any proud man. In this sense. One can see, also see Satan's fall. For the fall of any proud person reflects the fall of Satan, who in himself personifies pride. Y'all understand? That's why Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, who was a murderer in the beginning. So she brings up then, why is this man called light? out of uh, uh, Isaiah 14 well because she don't understand a fake she don't understand what a counterfeit is so she says come on Jesus is the light how is he the light because he's a counterfeit light the world have a light it is it is a man made light <laughs> it is not the true light of God it's man-made. It illuminates just like us. And it is a perceived light. It is like a, a wolf who puts on sheep clothing. Jesus and Satan are both lions. One come as a roaring, and Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Israel. He's a counterfeit. He's a fake. And someone didn't show her that. This also shows why, especially with younger Christians, we cannot solely rely on King James. Yeah, be careful, uh, Brentick. They're gonna crucify you for messing with their King James. They're gonna crucify Mirage. Yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah, yeah, Brentick. You better run, bro. Run for your life. You just cussed. <laughs> you you did a grave cussing. <laughs> Prime example of intel intellect. Intellect. Trying to interpret scripture, the natural man can't understand the things of the spirit. Yes. Where it says king, it meant king, not Satan. What a bunk of trash. <laughs> Joan. Joan. 
is why it's important before one read a text, they need to understand the context. Apply the come on, come on, Williams. Williams, thou art the yes, yes. King James was good enough for Paul. It's good. <laughs> 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 Sydney, that's good. <coughs> My brother <coughs> Rodney loves to talk like that. He, he teases his, his his people. Yeah, Paul and Jesus read from King James. <laughs> That's why I love reading the other translations besides. Yes, you got to do it. You got to do it. Now y'all messing with y'all messing with Michelle Carter's uh, her bottom line. Y'all be careful. A, a pride goes before destruction and the hardest spirit. Yes. All right. Ezekiel uh, Pitts is putting Ezekiel twenty eight up there. All right. So lastly, um, I want to talk about. Your, your brother Will Smith Will Smith and Jada Alright Do I care about their marriage Not really No they, they have been wild Ever since they said I do I don't care But unfortunately I have to care You know why I have to care about their marriage I want y'all to take a wild guess And those of you who know me Have been watching my shows forever Should know the answer Why do I must care <laughs> about Will and Jada Pinkett's matrimony? Hmm. Why should I care? Hmm. This is why because uh, someone goes to college doesn't. Right, right, Deeks and Decoop. That's good. My father once told me a story. Show the preachers who would not travel and preach because they thought the word the word said. Oh, wow. Take no school. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, Yvonne says, the kids, no private interpretation. Got to read more. <laughs> yeah. Kids and sanctity of marriage. Yes. What a man do in his, his matrimony with his wife is up to him and them. They could do whatever it is in between them and God. Fine. But when they come into the public eye like this and they become so famous, they are persuaders and influencers, even possibly to my own children. Because mm -hmm. black people constantly holding them up as goals, regardless of their immoral state, the black church will support their blackness in lieu of the world. You understand what I'm saying? So I have to bring it up because they are a huge influence on us who are believers. The apostle Paul says that we are not supposed to judge the world. We, he says, I would have to remove myself from the world physically to escape that. He says, so I don't judge the world. I judge the church. All right. But when I bring up worldly people, I bring them up not to judge them, but to judge you who are being pulled by them. Do you understand? I don't know if you understand. Um, R. Kelly will be put in jail for the rest of his life. He's going to prison. We know there's another case in here in Illinois and another case in, um, I don't know, uh, Minnesota, I believe it is. But New York have enough power right now to put him away for life. You understand? I've did several shows on R. Kelly. Many. Right? They're all on Facebook and YouTube. Many. So we're, we're, we're full. We're full. But I had to bring those shows up. Because many of my believing brothers and sisters were saying, free that man. And the honorable to some, Louis Farrakhan says, you must forgive. The problem with you pro-black folks is that you're always trying to forgive something that we've done, but you won't forgive the white cop who went into the that house, thought that apartment was hers, 
and she shot the boy in his own apartment. She, they finally, through public cry, she got charged, arrested and charged, and went to trial. And justice was served, but you could not forgive her, even though the brother of the slain asked the judge, may I hug her? And you looked at that as a deplorable act, but forgive R. Kelly and forgive Bill Cosby and forgive all these other black folks because they're black. So when y'all get pulled by that type of persuasion, no teaching, thank you, Pitts, selective forgiveness, you are a fool. You are a fool. Come on, you err on the wrong side of the right and wrong, Vance Vanzel. There it is. All of a sudden, you are holy. And you are righteous in your teachings. Uh, free the man. He's done something wrong. And you've got to be able to, okay, forgive him. But he must go to prison. The thief on the cross. Jesus forgave him. Did Jesus take him off the cross? Sounds wrong coming from a believer, a mind of God, doesn't it? But I, I too went to jail. And told the the uh, the uh, the judge, to if you keep me in this jail, you're doing the right thing. So for those of you who want to judge me and say, "How dare you?" The Bible says that. What does the Bible say? You tell me what the Bible say. But I'm telling you from my own experience, I judged my own self and said, "Put me in the jail," because I did a, an illegal act. I've told this story. And I said, Judge, if you put me back in there, this was my sentencing, I says, I belong there. You did the right thing. And because I was truthful in what I said and I was transparent, the judge says, I can't put you in there. I will be putting a good man in jail. Right is right. Let the judge be the judge. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you, if you do, did the crime, you yes. Most times people say forgive because they've done something. Come on, haircut man. Yeah, it's almost that time, man. I got about two more days. Come on, man. You better preach this. Ain't nobody screaming free R. Kelly, but a few men with a very low value. Yeah. The only thing I respect about R. K. is he so far didn't punk out like like. Like who? Oh, Weinstein. Oh, who? J. Red. Ouch. Jesus did not take him off the cross. You've got to reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amber uh, Geiger and Botham uh, Jeans. Yeah, hugging her. And y'all, the black community went bonkers. To the point y'all started making up stuff and said that the, the bailiff was playing in the girl's hair. Look at her. Just, ooh, girl, what you use? I I use palm olive in my head. What you use, Amber? Oh, I use uh, after six. After six? Mm -hmm. No, nah, girl, listen. You should put you some Chanel number five in there, and it'll be, bam. I'm going to wash that gray right out of my head. It's going to be bouncing, and it's going to be behaving, Amber. Yeah, it will, girl. Yeah, girl, let me comb that on out. Come comb. You got to look good for the camera. That's what y'all thought the girl was doing. Until you found out later on that the bailiff was checking for what? And she does that for everybody who's on the stand. Well, everybody who's... Oh, women who've got that uh, that kind of hair. Look at her. She just... is she Y'all always grooming the white women. <laughs> I just laughed through all of that mess. She was checking her for contraband. And then they went after the judge who allowed the hug. And then they went after the judge who presented a Bible to Amber. <laughs> and tried to witness to the girl. Y'all crazy. Something's wrong with y'all. 
Uh, y'all, y'all, uh, y'all are in need of a checkup. Kelly crucified himself for decades. He had been doing this and getting away with it. You've got to put men like that away. They are a danger to themselves and many others. Put them away. Protect society from a predator. You must put them away. I don't care what kind of music. You, the problem with us is that the, the music causes us to forgive and the color of the skin causes us to forgive. We have been soothed in the sayings. We've been Pied Piper to death. Matter of fact, ain't that what he called himself? The Pied Piper of R&B? He got y'all. Y'all on picket signs out front in the jail. Free R. Kelly, free R. Kelly. And all these poor women and boys for the rest of their life will live in infamy. It's bad, y'all. And when the feds come after you, it's a closed case. Do you hear me? The Fed is the most patient organization or government agency in the world. When the feds come after you, they've studied you sometimes for years. They've studied you for years. And once they pick up the phone and say, okay, go get him or go get her. Or you can get a lawyer all you want to. But they about to show you a rap sheet of evidence and receipts. Or they're going to show you receipts. And they're going to show you 5, 10, 15 years of it. You get into the grips of the feds. They have built up a case over time. They'll come to your door and sit down in your living room and have coffee with you. Watch TV and go to sleep and leave. Say, thank you. I had a great time. <laughs> You're like, "Ooh, I got away. And they won't come back to another year later and say, uh, you're under arrest. <laughs> what? We had tea and crumpets together. I sang you a lullaby. I gave you mama's greatest, the best part of the apple pie. The great part of waking up. Folgers in your cup. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we know, we know. But you're under arrest. Oh, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to freeze all your accounts. The feds will wait for you patiently like a dog sits at the front door when you go to work. You have no idea what he's going to do yet. <laughs> yeah, you ain't got yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, the feds know how to slow walk a person and will get exactly what they came for. <laughs> Let me tell you. When they call, you just say goodbye to everybody. Have a have a goodbye party for everybody. I gotta go. I got. When you where you going? Well, I wait. How long are you gonna be gone? I see you in heaven. <laughs> I see you in heaven. Uh, followed my brother for five years and brought the case against. Mm, got five. See what I'm saying? Five years. Yeah, you ain't getting away. They like God. You might get by, but you won't get away. <laughs> Elder JD, bless it to you, sir. It's so good to see you. <laughs> With the feds, you can get by, but you won't get away. Nope. Nope. Y- y'all keep thinking that D- Donald Trump has got away and he keep escaping. All right. <laughs> Todd said, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I guess RK was fed up. <laughs> <coughs> That's brilliant. What about all the others involved? He didn't do it alone. Yeah, Bree, I talked about that on all of my R. Kelly shows. You're right. I brought up the men who protected and brought those girls and the parents. I brought them up too, who introduced their daughters to him. All of them need to be in that pot. I see a clock keeper. I got to go, y'all. Even Jordan Peterson said that he never saw any anyone ever get away. Ooh-wee. That Jordan Peterson. Yeah, 
Neither has Hillary Clinton or the Bidens. <laughs> D Coop, just sneak that in there. All right. Uh, yeah, right quick. Uh, yeah, I'll take a question. J Red, I'll take a question real quick because I know I missed I missed your question last time. You didn't have time. I'll, I'll I'll read yours and then go. Yeah, accessories. All right. Pedagogy is the discipline of of study related to the field of education and a teaching method. The word is derived from the Greek pedagogia, means to lead a child, which was in turn taken from pedagogos, or teaching a boy. In the Greco or the Roman culture, a pedagogos was a slave responsible for the education of boys. And it's mentioned three times in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 4 and 15. Galatians 3 and 24 and 25. Pedagogos. Okay. Which is where we get pedagogy from. It's translated from the word tutor or guardian or schoolmaster. The law was our pedagogos to lead us to Christ. Galatians 3.24. This is the method in whom in which we have lost the art of. And they, they have them in your schools, what have you. But in our in our churches, unfortunately, we walked away from the art of teaching. This is why when people come to my show, I take y'all through a myriad. I take you through a historicity, <laughs> okay? I take you through the beginning, the history. Uh, here's the lesson. Here's the history of the lesson, and it may take me an hour and a half to catch up to the current events, but pedagogy tells me, and my style is, I can't tell you that two plus two is four and convince you unless I take you to the beginning. I got to take it to the beginning. I got to give you the basic structure of how did I come up with this equation? You understand? So my subjects can take a while for me to get to the meat and some people leave. Why? Because they are impatient. They don't want to learn. And they are uh, illiterate themselves. They just don't want to learn. They want to hear about salaciousness and, and, and bad news and sex and violence and they you know they want me to be the tabloid and my show don't do any of that mess so when i don't get to the tabloidness they go over there to you know whom but the smart people come over here and wait and be patient as they go through the process of pedagogy y'all understand what i'm saying hope that's helping you a little bit jesus was the perfect teacher a master of pedagogy our lord Use illustrations, object lessons, current events, and stories just like what I do. He utilized lecture and discourse, and he engaged the students in dialogue, and he asked rhetorical questions. He dispensed proverbs and turned questions around to force his hearers, his hearers to formulate an answer. Mark 10, 18. Preached, and he taught it. He modeled it correctly. Do the homework, he would say. Follow up on it. It's a great thing to do. This will help people stay. You know what I'm saying? They want the, the piping hot tea. Mm hmm. Yeah, the actress was really wondering where you were. Hey Amen. Did you say hit the like button? You couldn't pay me to go back into the classroom unless I'm subbing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please explain who the pillar of the ground is. Man, you, you, I'm gonna have to do a whole show on that because you can't be asking them. You can't be asking a big question like that, and then say it, it, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't make me just touch on it just a little bit, and then and then we're done. <laughs> can't you can't do can't do that, man. <laughs> you can't do that oh man okay where you at 315 
Where are we? Okay, here we are. Second charge. Behave thyself in the house of God. Okay? He's given the qualifications uh, of the of the uh, the elder, the bishop, the superintendent, supervisor, the deacons, the deaconess. Then he gets he goes into a second charge, obviously, here in First Timothy chapter three. Uh, these things I write unto you, hoping to come into the shortly as you know that he's writing a letter. He's on a missionary journey. But if I tarry long, uh, thou hast made know how thou ought to behave. Uh, where am I? Uh, thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, which he answered it, by the way. He answered it. All right. Let's 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 go. Because remember, I was talking about pericopes. I use that word a lot. Let's go to the other translation so that we can see what other words that they might have used so that for those who don't know, know what the pillar is <clears throat> we can compare the two because he answered it in the same verse <clears throat> uh, three let's go to 314 in this translation let's go to NLT I'm writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon so that if I am, if I'm delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar of foundation of the truth. Now, t to better answer that question, oh, he says, without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Mm, that's another one. Christ was revealed in the human body and vindicated by the spirit. Oh man, this is good stuff. I need a whole show after this because it's good. Okay. Now, Jay Red, let me ask you a question because sometimes you have to answer a question based off of the intent of the question. All right. So, so if you would do us all a favor, why did you ask that question? What is the pillar? Okay. Because some have used this to say you must go to church which means inside of a building why because it is the pillar and foundation of the truth so i have to ask you why did you ask that question <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's saying the household of god where is the household of god isn't Jesus Christ the pillar and the fire? Ah, that verse. All right, Jay. Notice that I stopped, I, I stopped reading and then I says, 16 says, without question. <laughs> without question. So he answered it. Uh, he, he, he gave the answer, but then he explained the answer. The answer is the household of God. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. It's mysterious to those who don't understand. He says, Christ was revealed in the human body and vindicated by the spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. That's the full answer. So, yes. Everybody can't go to church. So, what is the, what is the pillar of our faith? Everybody can't go to church. As a matter of fact, these uh, after the temple was destroyed, they didn't, they didn't really have buildings. They they had homes that they communed in. So he's talking about conduct in the household of God. Well, that household of God could have been, uh, you know, they met in Mary's house. This is the church of the living God. <laughs> you weren't talking about a building. You understand? Because the building is not the foundation of truth. You looking forward to that show? I just did it. <laughs> I just did it. Lim would say, house to house. There is a meeting going on in your city. The temple just saw a man raise almost $50,000. Really? What meeting? 
Oh, are you talking about um, John Hanna? Is that what you're talking about? If that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I saw that meeting. <laughs> the body of Christ is the church. We were made of dust. Dust can be made into cement. Therefore, we... Oh, what? Well, David! David, I didn't know you was a scientist. <laughs> this is pretty good. <laughs> Pitts is giving it to us, y'all. Verse 16. Yeah, I saw it. I, I saw it at the beginning where the girls were dropping it like it was hot. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I saw it. And if I if I go into it, I, I may get in trouble. John Hanna is my dear friend. This is him right here. Hey, this is John Hanna, and you're listening to the Sir Walter Jones Show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, that's proof. He's been my friend for a long, long time. <laughs> but as y'all know, I don't pander to my friends. Uh, that thief on the cross never set foot in the church. But Jesus, ooh, Amber, man, you're cutting hard. You're cutting so hard that Beverly is doing your job. <laughs> you cut so hard, I got to quit. Because if, if Beverly's putting up the clock, that means she want me to cut it out. She needs me to stop. <laughs> so let me stop, y'all. I took a few days off. Y'all don't miss me? I took a few days off. And the show was supposed to re uh, play Monday night, and he got jacked up about what's under your cover or get under the cover. <laughs> and Y'all don't even miss me. That's a shame. I feel so insulted. Uh, let's see what the my book says here. I'll read this and shut it down. Uh, Beverly, I'm going to shut it down. Let's see, does, does, does the footnote say anything about what I say? Yeah, Amanda, they were twerking. <laughs> they twerked. Oh, they dropped it like it was hot. <laughs> um, the function of the church is to support and transmit to the world the truth God has revealed. That's what 15 says, J. Red. Paul delineates the content of the truth, the mystery or revealed secret is great in its importance, not in its obscurity. And it is without controversy. That is beyond all question. Its purpose and its result are to produce godliness. The rhythmic construction of Paul's summary suggests that he may be quoting an early hymn or creedal confession. And he never mentions a structure called the church. That's your answer, the pillar and ground of the truth. All right, y'all. I think I've bored your patience enough. You be kind and rewind, and uh, we'll do this again tomorrow. If you want me to, if not, um, I'm not going. I'm not going to cry. Not in front of you, but I will after the show. You miss me? You was here earlier. Oh, she said. Oh, yeah, yeah. I asked. Did, did y'all miss me? At least somebody missed me. <laughs> okay, Angela. Angela's here. Angela missed me. Because the rest of y'all don't miss me. I, don't, I feel horrible. Uh, we say the church is not the building, but we don't operate like it. If we did, it would force us to deal with the world. Ooh, Timothy. Timothy, you. Man, wow. As I did suspect, that verse is often mis uh, yes, misrepresented, J. Red. It is. A lot of these scriptures are misrepresented misinterpreted and used to manipulate and we, we could try to use witchcraft to use, use the word because the devil did it the devil used the scriptures to try and taunt Jesus and offer him the world everybody uses scriptures worldly people use the scriptures um, um, the one these secular programs is news stations what's the name of that that show um, I forgot the name of it They'll use the scripture. Now they don't. They they atheists, and the atheists will say, "Now here's what the scriptures say." <laughs> because somebody who's a believer will say something so crazy. Usually, the white evangelical will say something in politics, and so these atheist shows will say, "You know, it's just ridiculous. It, that doesn't make any sense." And and then they'll go and say, "Now, matter of fact, this is what the scripture really says." And they'll go into the scriptures <laughs> and totally miss it. Yeah. All right, y'all. Good night to you. Peace is going to bed. That means I must go as well. You know. 
I thank y'all. God, I thank you for your presence, your blessings, everything you've done for us tonight. The word is here. It went forth. You gave it to me to share. How can they hear without a preacher? But how can he preach except you sent him? For God, I know for a fact you sent me. But you said that you would give grace to the humble and resist the proud. So God, help me to stay humble. Stay in your word. Not get puffed up and, and persuaded by all of these winds that come my way. Thank you for keeping me grounded, God. Because some days it can be difficult, but I search you and you're always found. I can find you everywhere. No matter where I am, I find you. So I thank you. For these people here, allow them to sleep sound tonight. For those of you who are watching live, allow them to sleep sound tonight. You've given them a nice dinner. Let them rest. And for those who will watch me in the daytime, give them peace throughout their day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hit the share button. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. There's about 91 of you watching now because we've been on here for a little while. If you would hit the thumbs up, it will share the gospel all over the world. It really, really would. Okay. And subscribe to the channel and what you all have been doing. Praise God. YouTube, Facebook, I mean, share it on your page if you want to. All right. And the gospel will be preached throughout the world for the second time. Bless us to y'all. Thank you. Amen. Brother Pritchard, I love you. See? You had my heart pippitating. Papatitting, pitter patting. I don't know. Twitter paid it. My heart was doing something. Okay. Good night, y'all. Take care of yourselves and one another. All right? Uh, I got to go, ch ch go check the mailbox. Hadn't checked it yet, but I'll check it in the morning. If you send me something, I'm excited to read it. Bye-bye. Fellas, does it seem like you can't get a good woman? Ladies, wonder why you can't keep a man? Then read The Four Women That Men Desire, Volume 1, by Sir Walter Jones to figure out how to break the cycle. Go to Amazon.com to get your copy today. Right, Mr. Walters? Mm.